assassination documentary comic. But mostly I work in making kids comics, and then I also work in Ann Arbor, Michigan as a teaching artist, which is to say that I do classes on making comics. I've been doing it for about seven years. And uh, this is a one-hour version of a two-day workshop I did at the John <laughs> Kennedy Center. <laughs> yeah. We're going to blast through this super fast. Um, but the good news is, is that you don't have to worry about drinking it all in and taking copious notes because participation in this workshop grants you a 61-page kit uh, with out-of-the-box lesson plans to do exactly what we're going to do today. <laughs> Thanks to TCAP. Thanks to Andrew and the guys for printing these out. Um, and if, there, if we run out, I will give you guys a link to get a PDF of this. Oh. And uh, there's art in here that I've licensed to you to use in your classroom. So first, let me start by asking, who here uh, is a teacher? Keep your hand up if you're elementary school. High school. OK. College. Oh, no college. OK, so I'm, I will say this, this. What we're going to model today is a uh, classroom activity that I developed for grades three through five. But I have taught these workshops in at the University of Michigan and in high schools as well. And I think it's especially fascinating how third to fifth grade, a lot of the preloading that I ha have to do in terms of like you don't have to draw well uh, that isn't as necessary with that age group, but once you get into high school and college, it's like I have to like really yank on. I'm like, don't worry about drawing so good. It's okay. Uh, and let me let me let me ask this: Who here likes to draw? Who here of those people say, "Hey, I drew a thing. It looks like a thing." <laughs> <laughs> Who here has ever drawn something? This goes for everybody. Who here has ever drawn something? Says, I got no business holding a pencil. I'm going to cut my hands off. Who just made? I do this for a living. I do. I get paid money, and the crime is, is that I draw stuff that I hate all the time, right? So, so you're not alone. But the first point that I want to make, and this is the big surprise of the day, is oh, besides that, <laughs> besides that I love my cat. <laughs> the first big surprise of the day is, I hope you will all draw today. I have pencils and paper, and yeah, I'm going to encourage you to draw today. Who, who's, who got scared by that? OK. If you were scared by that, then I'm going to say this. Uh, I want us to look at these two images, and I want us to, this is, just, this is not a trick. This is just an opinion thing. Look at these two images, these two comics pages. I want you to decide for yourself which one you like better, which one is better. And the only thing is you've got to tell me why. You can't go, oh, I'm just good, that's all. That's not an answer. You know this. You're educators. you got to give me some rationale, some reason, some explanation. Why do you have that opinion? What evidence do you have to support your position on which one of these is better? Yes? I like that one. There's less words. This one? Yeah. Not as quite as busy? Yeah. OK. That's a good reason. Maybe you like a little bit more clarity, a little bit more open space in the kind of art that you enjoy. Who else has an opinion? Right here. I like the one on the left as well. It just feels more organic to me. Organic? That's an interesting word. This feels inorganic somehow? Or it just feels more organic? More organic. Okay, they're both organic, but this one just feels a little bit Drawn more... by a human. No. Yeah, this one you get at the farmer's market, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, oh, the one on the right is beautiful. It's like proficient. There's a certain charm to the one on the left that makes me like that. Technically proficient. Oh, this one has charm. Okay, now let's just do show, show of hands. Who likes this one better? One, two, three, four. Who likes this one better? Whoa! All right. Who thinks they were drawn by the same person? Who thinks they were not? Okay. This is the only trick of the day. They were drawn by the same person. I drew both of these. I drew this when I was 11. And I drew this a few years ago. First point, when it comes to drawing, just like any skill, riding a bike, you don't get on a bike and go, like, where do I put my feet? You just know where to put your feet. When you draw every day, you just get better. I didn't go to art school. I just trained myself every day since I was seven years old, right? So you agree that this looks technically proficient. But a lot of you guys like the stuff I did when I was 11 better. <laughs> Which kind of makes my heart go crazy. <laughs> because I've been drawing comics professionally for almost 20 years now. And in that 20 years, I've had to study anatomy, drawing the human body in every conceivable angle, perspective, making objects look like they exist in three dimensions, fabric fold, super hard to learn, how the clothing interacts with the human body. There's a lot to learn. I spent a lot of time getting to be as good as I am. In 2007, I did a graphic novel called The Front, Rebirth, uh, which you can find online for free. And in it, I introduced this character named Jared the Abominable Snowman, who became the most popular character in the story. Why? Because he's a big furry monster with the mind of a child, and that's cute. That's funny, right? Lots of emails. People saying, we love Jared. Do more stories about Jared. Every time Jared shows up, we have a really good time. So as a thank you to my readers, I decided to do a holiday card 
for them as if Jared drew it, okay? Holiday cards with the mind of a child. Okay. Look like this. <laughs> and the readers went bananas. They said, Jersey, this is the best thing you've ever done in your entire life. Do a whole series like this. <laughs> and again, just like a few moments ago, my heart went creep, creep, creep. <laughs> because I spent all this time <laughs> trying to get good. <laughs> and you're telling me all I gotta do is these crummy little five second grand drawings? How can that be? Were my readers stupid? <laughs> no, what they were teaching me was a very important principle that we're gonna explore today, that you don't have to be a great illustrator to be a great storyteller. Comics is telling a story with images, regardless of the quality of the images, which sounds weird, right? Because comics are made of drawings, so they have to be good, right? No. Tony Cliff, Canadian cartoonist, Vancouver, said that the great thing about the time we're living in now in comics is that the uh, illustrative quality has very little to do with appeal. You can have a very appealing image that's very simply drawn, right? And co comic strips have been teaching us this for decades and decades. So that's my second point. First big point is you draw every day, you get good. Second point is nobody has to draw good today. You can have a perfectly, there might be a genius in this audience today, and you don't even know it. Your crummy stick figure comic might be the best thing anybody's ever seen, okay? And I'll also layer this on top. Don't draw better than me today because I got a really fragile ego. I'm the best artist in this room, remember? I've been saying for a long time. So when we draw, we're going to draw crummy. Okay. So with that, I'm gonna see how many of these I got. And maybe we might have to cluster a little bit more to share some of these. Pass them down. I did not expect this to be a turnout. <laughs> For assessing comic book work, Aww. it's loose, but it's there. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to ask you guys to do something really complicated, but I see the spark of intelligence in all the faces here. I know you guys can handle this. But I'm going to do some stuff with my body to signal what we're doing. What I'm going to ask you to do is assume the view, the, the worldview, and the mindset of your students. Okay? You are going to become your students for this modeling activity. I'm going to be the visiting artist who comes to your school to work with your kids, right? And I'm gonna model this activity so that you can take what so this is as much about pedagogy as it is about utilizing comics in a classroom. Okay? And I'm gonna walk through one of my workshops I do with kids. You guys are gonna interact with me as if you're your children, but you're simultaneously going to be listening for the interactions that happen between us as a teacher. So your teacher self is gonna be this ghost next to you watching you, the child, interact with the visiting artist so that the ghost teacher can then assume your body again and say, oh, that's how I'm gonna use this in the classroom. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, any questions about that? <laughs> It's weird, right? There's a lot of hippie stuff in this workshop. Uh, First thing I wanted to do is my little Yes, we actually we should be sitting in a semicircle on the floor, shouldn't we? I was gonna go up and steal one of those puppies. Actually, if you want to sit on the floor, that'd be awesome too. Um, I'm also, you know, this would be just before we start. Um, we're gonna grab pencils and paper in a second, but before we do that, I want to show you what I'm gonna do with my body to signal the different modes we're in. So, whenever I jump to the right. <coughs> See me jump to the right. That's me jumping out of my own body. My teacher ghost is talking to your teacher ghosts, right? And then I'll jump back into my body to the left, my left, your right, sorry. And then we'll resume the class. So when we find those observable moments that we want to stop and go like, hey, let's look at what we just did. Yes, question. You bet. I, I didn't want it to come to this, but <laughs> because I... Check one. Yeah, I, I get really, I get really excited and loud during this workshop, so I didn't want to disturb the rest of the building. But can you hear me okay now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so when I jump to your right, my left, we're in the workshop pretending together. When I jump to my right, your left, I'm a ghost. We're all teacher ghosts. We're all talking about what we just observed in the classroom. So we're gonna walk through that together, and then afterwards we're going to brainstorm some ways that we'll use this in our own classrooms. Make sense? Okay, so, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Jersey Joseph, I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, which is to say I'm a person who makes a living drawing comics. Um, the cool thing about comics that I like so much is that you don't have to draw awesome to be a great cartoonist. All you have to understand is four simple principles, four tools of cartooning. And we're gonna play with two of them today to make some comics of our own. First one is shape. 
So when we see round shapes, we think of like what kind of things? Like, well, I can go here. How about if I do this? Everybody see this okay? Yeah. Even those people in the cheap seats in the back? <laughs> so when I was your age, jumping to the, my right, I'm talking fifth, third to fifth grade, right? But I also can do this with older kids. We'll talk about modifications. Jump to the left. All right, so when I was your age and I was learning my mathematics, I remember thinking, seven looks like a mean number. Three looks like a nice number. Why would I say that? Why? Was I a weird kid? Or do you guys think similar things to that? Why would seven be a mean number, three be a nice number? What do you think? It has actual like, edges and angles for seven. Seven's pointy? Yeah, seven's pointy. <laughs> that might be a reason, yeah. Well, but that's kind of weird. I mean, why would pointy things be mean? Anybody else have an opinion? <laughs> it looks like lightning. It looks like, whoa, you just thought like a cartoonist just now. <laughs> because I see no lightning here. I see two black lines. But you just suddenly made the association, right? I want us to all kind of keep our eyes open for that. Is you're associating shapes with things. That's what cartoonists do for a living, right? So yeah, you see, right, like this, right? Let's talk about how, what else sevens can be. Seven, I go seven, 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 seven right? <laughs> Jumping out into my teacher ghost body. This is a magic trick, right? We just, and you don't have to know how to draw awesome to be able to do this magic trick. And especially if you're working with grade school kids, they will see this as a magic trick every time. Jumping back to left. So when we look at pointy things, as you pointed out, we can see dangerous things, dynamic things, right? Why would three be a kind shape, a friendly shape, as opposed to the seven? What? It's like a fluffy cloud. It's like a fluffy cloud, right? It's smooth, right? We can easily turn this into Snowman. Snowman are some of the best things life can offer us, right? <laughs> so yeah, smooth shapes, round things, tend to make us think of less threatening things. Babies, right? If I made, if I take a round shape, make a baby. Right? But if I made that baby out of pointy shapes, <laughs> Suddenly, it becomes very monstrous. <laughs> Nobody wants to cuddle with that baby. <laughs> or teddy bear, or whatever, right? Like smooth shapes equal friendly, kind, approachable. Pointy shapes equal dynamic. Yield signs are made out of triangles, right? This comes from our development, our lizard brains. Whenever we saw pointy things like teeth, we'd say, hey, watch out, I don't wanna mess around with that, right? Square shapes, what do we think of when we think of square shapes? Think about that association that you made a moment ago. What do we associate with square shapes? Think about things that you see in everyday in life, things that you observe in the world. Buildings. Buildings, right? Boxes, buildings. Boxes, buildings. Sturdy things, right? Uh, stable things. Square shapes equal strength, stability, calm, right? So when you think about how these shapes can be used with characters in comics, like you guys, who here has ever seen um, Disney's Aladdin? A few of us? There's a bad guy in that, in that story, what's his name? Jafar. Jafar. I mean, if you go back and look at the design of Jafar, I mean, that dude is made up almost entirely of triangles. Right? Even his fingers are pointy. And he's got the pointy beard. Yeah, he's got a circle on top. Why would he have a circle on the top? Anybody have any guesses why they would have put that there? Because think about what we know about the character. He's disguised himself. He's disguised himself. He comes off as a good guy, right? Hey, you can trust me, King. I'm a nice guy. But then there's all these triangles there that the designers put there to say to you, hey, watch out, this guy's kind of dangerous, right? So using shapes is one of the primary tools making comics. Doesn't even matter how well you draw, right? Okay, let's talk about size. Size in comics. This is one of the big ones we're gonna be playing with today. Uh, we've got two faces there. We've got two angry faces. And I'll just, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll draw them here. All right, two faces. Just to pay the thing, which one feels angrier to you? Just look at it for a moment, type to yourself which one you think is angrier, and I want an opinion. This is not a right or wrong answer. This is not a trick. I'm not gonna say, ha, you picked the wrong one. This is me saying to you, which one do you feel is angrier, but you gotta tell me why you feel that way. What do you think? The bigger one, because it feels like it's right in your face. It feels like it's right in your face. Again, you're making that association, right? This is, back here, I'll take the mic away. 
hey, you kids, get off my lawn, right? But that big one is me coming right up at you, get off my lawn. You're like, whoa, hey, dude, back off. Why are you, why are you screaming at me like that, right? Bigger equals emphasis. Bigger equals important. Bigger equals loud, right? Like, this is a quick experiment. Show me what you do with your body. You don't have to raise your hand. Just show me what you do with your body when you want to tell a secret. What do you do? Jumping to my left, or your left, your old children. <laughs> Jumping back into the teacher body. What do you do with your body when you tell a secret? Yeah, you get small, right? I don't want to see. I'm passing you a note. Yeah, I don't want the teacher to know. I'll meet you on the playground at 3 o'clock. What do you do with your body when you want to get mom and dad's attention across the store? You get big, right? Oh my gosh, Justin Bieber action figures are on sale for 30% off and I just got to have one or I'm going to die, right? So big equals important. Big equals loud. This is another tool that comes. This is why comic panels are different sizes. Jumping out into the teacher ghost body. We just heard Mr. Cloud talk about all this stuff about time. Now we're going to focus on emphasis a little bit too, right? Jumping back into the teacher, into the classroom. So big equals emphasis. Small equals less emphasis. That's why comic panels are different sizes. So. Then we get into a weird area, which I'm confident that all these brilliant young minds can comprehend. We talk about hippie stuff, we talk about lines. I'm gonna draw two lines. Which one's a calm line? Do you want your opinion? You gotta tell the line. Which one's a calm line? What do you think? Straight one. Why would the straight one be calm? It's just a line. It's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. I think water. You're making associations. You associate it with water, right? Jumping out again, a lot of times students will say, it's moving. It's not moving, it's just a line, it's just on paper, right? <laughs> Jump back into the classroom. So, yeah, yeah, so if I take those two angry faces again, now I'm gonna draw the same size. <laughs> Which one is angrier? What do we think? What? Uh, the one with the squiggly line, because you're almost like you're so mad that you're shaking. I guess. He's shaking with rage, right? Yeah. So, but he's not shaking. It's just it's just ink on paper. Nothing's moving. But it feels like he's moving, and that's why if you use this tool effectively, it doesn't matter how well you draw, right? Okay. And the last one we won't get to play around with a whole lot today, but it's something that I think a lot of us can intuit, and that's color, right? Uh, when we think of love, what color do we think of? Red, when we think of embarrassment, what do we think of? Okay. Red, right? Yeah, red is the color of passion. Whether it's anger, whether it's love, whether it's embarrassment. What do we think of when we think of loneliness? Blue. Gray. Gray, blue. What do we think of when we think of a nice peaceful spring day? Green. Green. Greens, Yellow. bl yellows, blues, right? What do we think of when we think of sick? Green. 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 So green can be sick, but green can also be life. So yes, so these different colors that we associate with different <coughs> colors as well. But we won't get to that as much, but I just want to put it on the table as a potential tool, jumping out into the ghost form, in case you guys have colored pencils in the classroom. Jumping back into the classroom. Okay, so now what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna construct a scene together. And I'm, we're gonna need a couple characters, a location, and then we're going to draw. So first I need a character that everybody in this room knows. What is a character that everybody in this room should be familiar with? Jumping out into the ghost form again. Think about what your kids are into right now. Jump back into the classroom. What's a character that, all our kid, that, that we all are familiar with? Who? Who? Mickey Mouse? Sure. Why not? Need another character. Superhero. Bugs Bunny? S superhero. What? Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Any? Batman? Iron Man. Iron Man. Oh, Iron Man was out in the, in the movies recently. Yes, that would be good. Anybody else? Ninjago. Ninjago. Mm, I like. Is everybody here familiar with Ninjago? Yeah. Jumping out the ghost form. Are we all familiar with Ninjago? It's even better if some of the people don't know. Then you get to make it up, right? All right, jump back into the classroom. So, what are the Ninjagos? Where are they going to be? What's a great location for these two characters to interact? Where are we going to have them hang out? We're going to have the, the, our story take place. Starbucks. Starbucks. Where else? Outer space. Outer space. Where else? Jungle. The beach in a shoe. <laughs> uh, martial arts dojo. Martial arts dojo. I'm gonna say this is the outer space martial arts dojo of shoes, where shoes is the ranking device. You get to rank. It's not belts. It's like I'm a black shoe in outer space. Right. So uh, so outer space space dojo of shoes. <laughs> okay, so we gotta have these two characters. They're uh, they're gonna be you know competing for you know they're gonna be doing a tournament for the next leveling up their shoes, and we're gonna have Mickey Mouse and Ninjago's competing. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write a script. I'm going to write five moments that we're all going to draw in our own way. Okay. okay. Uh, so let me get this off. Right. Panel one. Uh, Mickey. Should Mickey be more experienced or less experienced than the Ninjago? Less. 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 Oh, yeah. Raise your hand if you say more. Raise your hand if you say less. Oh, it's pretty split. <laughs> I get to decide. Right. So Mickey arrives to start training. At the dojo. The teacher... Now, not your teacher, mind you. This is a mean teacher. Uh, says, you can't train here. Panel three, Mickey, or Ninjago shows up. And says, that's not the ninja way. <laughs> Panel four, they fight. <laughs> Mickey, the teacher, and the ninja, they all fight. And then five, uh, okay, uh, Selena Gomez shows up. <laughs> Surprise ending, because uh, fighting is not a good idea after all, even if you are a ninja. So she shows up and says, don't fight, I have pizza. <laughs> I have pizza, the great peacemaker. So, and then I'll put panel six, if you guys have time, in the interest dot, 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 question mark, write your own ending to it, okay? So we got these five moments. I want you to think about them. I want you to visualize them. I want you to imagine them. I want you to think about for yourself, which one would be the most emphatic moment? Which is the most important moment? Is that gonna be a big panel or a small panel? What do you think? Which moment? Is good at like like if you take uh, the results of the fight. The results of the fight for you that could be yeah. Uh, notice I said they fight. I didn't say what kind of fight. I didn't say Michael Bay movie everything's exploding fight. I didn't say a bunch of little you know kids slapping in the face fight. I didn't say a bunch of dirty tricks fight. I just said they fight. You get to decide that. You get to picture that. What is the funniest or most interesting or most important fight that you can imagine? That's what I want you to draw. And then I want you to think about that size thing. Which is the biggest panel, which is the smallest panel, and why? Because I'm going to come around, I'm going to look at the work that you're doing, I'm going to talk with you about it. You've got to tell me why you chose these different size moments. And with that, I'm going to say there's pencils and paper in this box. Please come up and get a pencil and a piece of paper, and we're going to draw this together. I'm so glad that you guys all had the courage to do this. I just want to say this. This is where I'm going to be a boring grown-up just for a few seconds, and please bear with me. This is my privilege as somebody with gray hair. You have all done the work of professional cartoonists today. What a cartoonist does is they make associations, they think about what a story means, they think about what the volumes and the emphases are, and they communicate that in shapes and lines. And you've all done that. And I've seen some really impressive work today. And I thank you guys very much for all of your hard work. Thank you. Okay, jump back up. <laughs> now we're all teachers again. Reflecting, linking, thinking, what did we observe that happened in those interactions between me, the teacher, and you, the children? Was there anything that jumped out at you as like, that was a moment that resonated, that's something I want to remember, that's something I want to like maybe think about my own classroom experience? Yes? Everything was very positive. Everything was very positive. Yes, that is that's super important in my pedagogical style, like, especially working with young people, right? Um, you'll see in the rubric, in the, in the packet, that it's less about determining whether they did it right or wrong, but whether or not they're engaging with the different levels of comic storytelling. So it's not like, Oh, too bad they only did three panels instead of five. No, did they use different sizes of panels? Did they use different levels of density of image within those panels, right? So yes, it was a lot about honoring student interaction, student activity. Any other observations? I just think the emphasis on thinking about why was really important and like it doesn't, it's just that kind of high order thinking piece that um, nothing, everything can have meaning. Like, yeah. It was really, really great. You were all here for the McLeod talk, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a lot in there about how everything has meaning, right? Yeah, and no student in my classroom ever gets away with saying because. That's the only wrong answer, right? 
Uh, and I think there's always a way to rope an alternate answer into the larger discussion in some way or another, right? That is a challenge as teachers. That's when we start sweating and go home tired. But uh, I was trained under uh, Professor Mary Jo Finney of the University of Michigan. Anybody heard of her? She's the Dean of Education at the University of Michigan. And she once told me that if you don't go home exhausted, you haven't done your job, which sounds very drill sergeant-y. But as, as, a, as a white guy, that made me go, oh yeah, yeah that's how I feel. And so, uh, any other, yes? I just found it uh, uh, refreshing that uh, you were consistent with uh, not uh, putting emphasis on the artistic ability. I was eavesdropping. Mm -hmm. And not once did you make a commentary about uh, anybody's artistic ability, but rather about the narrative that was being presented to uh, the screen. My personal belief is that in, in teaching comics classes, you're teaching visual writing. You're teaching writing to a different learning modality, right? Because who here, and, and this is in the packet too, but who here has ever worked with a student who could communicate visually better than with words, right? Yes. I, w I was once, I did a, a, a series of workshops in Detroit where I was visiting schools that had no art program whatsoever. We're talking to fifth graders who had never taken an art class, which was horrifying to me. And I was working with this young boy. He drew this character with this orange plume on the top of his head. And I said, what is it? And the teacher, the teacher said, don't bother, he's not at reading level, you know? Yeah, and that made me cringe too. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, his brain is exploding, he's really mad. And he had a word balloon that said, I am M-A-I-D, right? He didn't know how to spell it, he didn't know how to express it verbally, but he sure had a complex metaphor of a volcano coming out of this kid's head, right? So yeah, this is about also honoring different learning modalities than just, you know, uh, text, verbal, yes? were flexible in terms of what you would whatever accept as as uh, as what was acceptable basically. So it was like, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, that's such a neat way of looking at it. Yeah, that's another part of this too. Is that uh, we're here to learn from the kids as much as they're here to learn from us. I mean, that's Socratic method, though, right? It's like you're 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 entering the room with the premise that everybody already knows this. You're just drawing it out of them. Right? And I'm not doing an act to play dumb. It's just more like, I want to know what you think of this thing. Right? Even when at the top of this, when I did the two images, and I said, like, which one do we like better? Right? It's like, it's like, what do you think? What do you think? I'm not giving you any prompts. I'm not telling you how to engage with this. You engage with it, and you tell me what you're reacting to. Any other? Yeah, sure. So in addition to having the students articulate why they were doing what they were doing, what I found great that you did also was that you took it from that you took that personal experience to the group and shared with the group an observation that dovetails. And for me, that made me feel like I'm in a community of people who are all together doing this. Yeah. Instead of, instead, like it's not, it's not a singling out, like, oh yeah, that. It's like, okay, yes, that, and everybody, that. Partially, it's because I don't know all your names. Right? Yeah. So I can't help. Hey, Jerry did this awesome thing. So, but, but also, it is partially not singling somebody out, right? right? Especially when you're working with like middle schoolers where they don't want to be singled out. Yeah. You know, so like it's about saying you're, you're sort of anonymously honoring their work while alerting the class to another teachable moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. The thing I thought was that the structure, because there's so much when having children drawing, is the one who sit there and go, I don't know what to draw for the entire 20 minutes. So giving a structure kind of frees us all up to go, well, now I just have to figure out how to draw it. And that kind of gets the plot out of the way a little bit. And then you can make your own plot if you want. Yeah, you get you get the people who get stymied by not having enough prompts to do it. Because like, sometimes some people will say like art is this liberating, freeing thing. We get to do whatever you want. If you work at comics long enough, you learn that limitations are actually your best friend sometimes, right? Like, you've got 12 pages, it's got to be about friendship, it's got to feature these characters and these exciting toys that we're trying to market in this comic, right? So, go, right? And then that can, like, lead you to, well, how do I solve the problems, right? Rather than, what am I going to draw today? But um, also, I still was careful to leave it open, and I, and I put, I shined a lamp on it. I said, like, I didn't say how they fight. You get to decide how they fight. You get to decide if your story's funny or if it's tragic, right? So, yeah. It's it's a balance between being didactic and being, you know, open, but uh, but yeah, but it is structured in a way, and all the lesson plans in there are structured in this way. They're, they're, they're front ended with a, a question and opinion session followed by an activity, and then with what time we got left, we talk about the interactions that happened with us while we were working. What what, what feelings were going through your head when you were drawing as a child? if you can go there. <laughs> <laughs> or if you need to lay down, we can do that. Yeah. Well, I like, because you 
showed us those techniques first, and I was like really proud because I was like, oh, there's my seven, and there's my three, <laughs> and like, like, I'm totally doing what you talked about, and, and it worked. I simplify them down four tools, right? So yeah. I do just mix and match those four the basic Are there elements. Tools in here? The four common elements of cartooning, yes, yeah. yes. There's there's a section in uh, drawing narratively where that, that stuff is addressed. Yes. Uh, at first, I'm very anxious um, making sure that that first panel contained everything and needs to be perfect. You know, I had all these things, and but I found that in your <coughs> I don't want to say the interruption, but when, when you were up there telling us like different shapes, talking about different words, and I'm like, okay, well, I got to move it along. It's just it's not about being perfect. It's just about getting that story down in the images. Those interruptions I do were as much about class rhythm as they are about teaching, right? Because if I say, everybody put your heads down and do the work now, and we're working, right? I hate that word so much, like this idea that we're doing the work because you're sucking all the joy out of it. And I don't want to. I don't want to go and sugarcoat it and say we're playing a game. It's a game. <laughs> it is fun, but it's also work. It's both, and work can be fun, and effort can be good. And that's something else I want to underline in a second. But while I'm doing that, I'm also like bringing your attention back up, letting you go back, look up, go back, and not saying pencils down, everybody. I've got something to show you, right? It's like because another thing that when I was a kid and my parents got called into the teacher's classroom because he's drawing Spider-Man too much and not paying enough attention to sociology. I was like, no, that was how I was internalizing information, right? I, I, my head was down, but my ears were on, right? And so you let the kids work while you're doing that too, especially in this kind of thing. Um, so a couple minutes left. Oh, but, oh, but the, I also want to underline the last line of the workshop. I don't know if anybody remember what was the very last thing I said. I said, thank you for your hard work. Right. So I'm honoring the fact that it was work, and I'm saying that I didn't say, "Oh, you're so talented, you're so gifted, and you're so it's so easy for you to do." No, it was work. It was it was effort for you guys to do that. And like you said, the first panel was really hard. You wanted to get it right. Honoring that, putting a note on it that it's work, but that's good, right? That's something that my that's my own personal. I'm injecting my philosophy into this, but anyway, yes. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning also the the option of doing a sixth one yeah. is really strong, right? Because you can do, like for people who, who don't, like they're not comfortable like with the unknown, like going into that, they can do the thing, the yep. five. And if there's someone who's got more or wants to express more or wants to engage or you know push creativity right at the end of it, they have that option as well. So you made it okay to do either. The Selena Gomez thing is a calculated move to get 13-year-old boys and girls to scream at me. <laughs> <laughs> and because that, that's engagement. Right, even if it's rage, it's engagement. Uh, and then I put in six because that is giving them. Okay, so you want to murder her at the end? Yes. You can have a truck run her over to to to, to, to preserve your masculinity, young man. You know that, that it's not cool for you to like Justin Bieber or whatever. Uh, that, that's part of that too. But it's also it's about like opening up creativity to them. Yeah, it's saying like if, if if this is too confining, you get to have a crazy cool ending at the end, right? Um, so we. You gotta wrap it? Okay, we got five minutes. Um, did I draw anything that you feel like you can't draw? I can hold up the sheets. Oh. <laughs> the baby. Huh? The baby. The baby, maybe? Maybe. You did it upside down. I, oh, because I was like this. <laughs> but I, I would submit that most of you could do this, right? Most of you, all of you can do this. Right, um, and that baby. I mean, I. It's, all of you can do this, yeah. Um, but that baby. I mean, it could be as simple as. Right, and then the whole idea there. <laughs> Can you not see it? It's kind of hard to see. But yeah, so like the whole idea is, is that you're just trying to show how monstrous its face becomes when you turn its face into a triangle, right? So, but yeah, I, I, I would suggest that like, this is the kind of thing where we forget sometimes that to the kids, being able to confidently put a line on any surface is a form of magic. And that's why I lead this workshop with this notion that this is all something you guys can do. You don't need... You can hire me to come to your school or library, and I would gladly come, but you don't need me to do it. You can all do this in your own classroom environment. Does anybody have any, uh, as a last one, does anybody have any ways that they're thinking off the cuff of how they might incorporate this to teach other subjects? What? Drama. Drama, how so? Um, 
like, <clears throat> it could easily do this um, kinesthetically in like Tableau, um, that type of thing. I once saw a teacher do this where they were doing this exact workshop and there's this little boy who, he, it was after lunch and he was a boy and he, well, he, had, he needed to express himself and he kept interrupting, kept talking, talking, talking and she had the presence of mind not say, stop it, I'm working here, I'm listen, you know, pay attention. She said, you know what, you're, you're feeling like you got a lot of energy. Do you want to act out this scene? You know, I'm going to write the scene. Do you want to act it out for everybody? And okay, everybody, everybody in the room. Now, when you get to the point where you think that would make a good panel, everybody yell freeze. Right? And so this kid got to have his energy, got to have to show off. He's still participating in the exercise, right? So it could be used also in the comics class, but yeah, I agree. It definitely, I mean, part of the thing we did was what do you do with your body when you tell a secret, right? Let, let's act this stuff out. Yes? You can have the, have the kids sketching out historical battles and sequences mm -hmm. and whatnot, and that way they, they can identify who they feel the good guys and bad guys in history based on the shapes that are up there. Who here feels like they could? Uh, evaluate a student's book report done in comics form. Yeah, right? And I know that some of you guys are already doing stuff like that, right? Like history reports, book reports told in comics. And yeah, I mean, I would have I would have jumped over anything to get access to that kind of classroom experience when I was a kid. All right, uh, we've got time for one more observation. Um, I think you can also try uh, teaching it using math as well. Again, so? um, I'm thinking you need to design a building with this certain amount of area or this you know, type of shape, but it's all up to them. Or yeah. yeah. Yeah, and well, and you can, you can teach abstract concept, concepts through visuals, right? Yeah. So like um, there was a comic in the 60s called The Metal Men. Have you heard of that? They, they took chemical metals and personified them. And so here's gold, and he's very conductive and very strong, <laughs> but he's stretchy. And here's Mercury, he's like super, you can't, you can't hold on to him for very long. Here's lead, he's a really thick guy. And here's platinum, she's like super shiny and glamorous and can stretch around all the place. And when I was a kid, one of the very first comics I did was a comic called Silver and the Periodic Forces, which was about a silver alien who could summon characters representing each of the chemical elements. <laughs> so here's sodium and here's, and here's uh, hydrogen and oxygen, they're gonna combine into this explosive entity, you know. Uh, so, and then when I took chemistry classes, it helped me recall information about, you know, it didn't help with the algebra, but it helped with like, <laughs> memorizing chemical properties, right? So yeah, you could also use it in like like really crass ways, like just personifying things too, in character form. But yeah. Okay, well with that I will say thank you so much for participating in this thing. Um, if, if you want the packet, I know a lot of you guys didn't get the packet, and I know that's is that with your hands, but <laughs> Alright, so um, I, I will be glad to give you the link at the end. If you, when you talk about it, I can give you my email address, um, and you can email me. I can send you the, the link to it. Um, I'm also going to be tabling at TCAP this weekend if you want to talk more about this stuff. So thank you guys once again for all of your hard work. Thank you. Oh, yeah.